Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to um, the Printing Industry Midwest uh, webinar, Marijuana in the Workplace, Implications of Legalization. Um, we have Tom Revenue here from Peters Revenue, Kepperman and Anderson Law Firm. Um, they are a longtime member of the Printing Mid Industry Midwest, and um, Tom Revenue is now a a member of our board of directors. He will be providing the presentation today. This presentation will also be recorded. So we will provide you the recording um, by the end of the day or probably at the latest tomorrow. Um, we want to thank you for joining today. If you have questions, um, if you could use the Q&A app at the, wherever at, in, on your screen to, um, ask questions. We will be monitoring that section for you, um, and we will try to get to those answers as soon as possible. I, I think Tom will be looking for them. Um, if not, we'll open it up at the end as well for questions. Um, Tom, if you are ready, you can take it away. Sounds good. Thanks very much, Chris, and thanks for PIM for having me uh, present today. I'm just going to turn off my video um, and I'm going to talk about marijuana in the workplace and of course I can tell you that I remember in college uh, quite some time ago uh, when I was in college there was a group called the National Organization of Reform Marijuana Laws that would protest every day or every April 1st uh, to get marijuana legalized across the country and of course I remember walking through their protests thinking never will this ever happen in my lifetime and of course we've seen it happen in other states and now it's here in Minnesota and we have to um, address what that means in the workplace how do we uh, handle marijuana in the workplace and what does it mean as it relates to our drug testing policies and procedures and so I'm going to go through and give you a summary today of essentially what the law provides. Now, one thing I will tell you is that when we get a new law coming into existence, sometimes there's some ambiguities that it, there's gonna take some time uh, to clarify things. And unfortunately, clarifying some of those items may mean through uh, the court system, which is something that we all would like to avoid. But um, we'll walk through what the law means as I as I understand it and a lot of uh, attorneys representing employers understand this law but in essence when we talk about recreational marijuana in Minnesota just a little bit of background what it means is that in Minnesota we become the 23rd state in the country to legalize recreational marijuana use uh, individuals who are over the age of 21 can purchase up to two ounces of cannabis flour eight grams of uh, cannabis concentrate and 800 milligrams of edible products at any time, and they can possess those amounts in public. Uh, adults are allowed to grow up to eight plants at home, uh, though only four plants can be mature and flowering at any time. I'm not sure who's going to police uh, whether more than four plants are flowering at any given time. And then, of course, we've heard a lot in the media that misdemeanor convictions of marijuana are automatically being um, expunged, but this process will take up to a year. The effective date of the law, which I know a number of you are asking questions, uh, it's essentially August 1st is when all of this will come into existence. I think as far as for employer employees or the general public to buy legalized marijuana, I think it's going to take uh, a lot longer than August 1st, but the protections under this uh, state law do take effect August 1st. As I said, there's quite a few laws or quite a few states that have legalized marijuana uh, in this chart obviously needs to be updated because uh, Minnesota now has legalized uh, recreational marijuana as well. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about Minnesota's marijuana laws and what it means. So a step back, uh, of course, about eight years ago, Minnesota passed its medical cannabis program, which essentially allowed individuals who were certified by healthcare providers 
to use medical marijuana for certain conditions. And typically speaking, they were cancer, Alzheimer's, MS, ALS, autism, among other uh, conditions. And there'll be some new ones that are added as of August 1st, and that, that's a obsessive compulsive disorder and irritable bowel syndrome will be added. Now, I think some things that we overlook is that if somebody is using medical marijuana, uh, their conditions may also qualify for a reasonable accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act as well as state and local disabilities, right? Uh, so somebody who has cancer obviously would be an individual who has a disability and we may have a duty to accommodate them. And of course, with regard to if they're using medical cannabis, there could be some obligations that we're gonna have uh, to talk through with, with employees. Uh, but with regard to the medical, medical marijuana program, which has been open for eight years, I think there's some interesting statistics. And that is when the program first in, uh, started, we had just less than a thousand uh, individuals that were enrolled in the program. And as of last count, at the end of last year, there were 40,000 Minnesotans that had enrolled in the medical, medical cannabis program. And of course, what had been a hot topic last summer was the legalization of the THC edibles, which essentially allowed individuals 21 years or older to purchase the edibles and we have the liquor stores that are now stocking these legalized THC gummies. Um, employees or the general public can buy uh, products with um, two milligrams of THC per serving and up to 50 milligrams per package. The law did not limit uh, how many milligrams that they could buy uh, as far as how many packages they could buy. And with regard to the THC that was being used in these edible cannabinoid products, it had to be derived from hemp and not from marijuana. The problem was it doesn't make a difference because uh, if somebody eats the edible products, uh, they'll still test positive on a drug test because those products have what is referred to as Delta-8 and Delta-9, and that leads to positive tests from a marijuana test if you send somebody for, for a drug test. And I'll talk a moment about what that means. But as you can see, there's been this eight year process of us as a state getting to the recreation of marijuana, going back to the legalization of medical marijuana and then the edible products last year. And now we get into uh, recreational marijuana. And there are some things that the general public isn't hearing about. And I always point this out because I think it uh, is interesting to hear. Uh, but within the 319 page bill that became law, uh, there's a few things that were built in uh, that I, that I uh, pulled out just uh, to humor you for a little bit. But if you're an employee, who's working for a business that is selling recreational marijuana, you're allowed to sample the marijuana up to three times in a 24 hour period of time, as long as you don't interact with customers for three, three hours afterwards. Uh, second, if you are a business that wants to sell marijuana, you have to enter into what is referred to as a labor peace agreement with the union. In other words, uh, you have to enter into a collective bargaining agreement. And of course, employees who work at these businesses, they can't show up to work under the influence, but then they can engage in quality control. And then within the bill, uh, which I'll talk about uh, in more detail, is that marijuana, both recreational marijuana, as well as the edible products are now clearly defined as lawful consumer products, which means you cannot take action against an employee as a result of these products on that basis of, alone. And I'll touch on that in a little bit more detail. 
another another common question raised by clients or seminar attendees is what about federal laws? What about I have employees that are covered under federal laws, such as I have to test my DOT covered drivers. Keep in mind that state law does not alter the existing federal laws on drug and alcohol testing, including marijuana. So you, if you are testing employees as required under federal law, nothing changes with regard to the employees covered under federal law. The big issue uh, where we're getting a lot of questions and where employers are trying to understand what their rights are is when recreational marijuana was legalized, part of the bill that became law included amendments to Minnesota's drug and alcohol testing in the workplace statute, um, which is referred to as DATWA. And I think it is helpful to go through uh, with seminar attendees what Minnesota's drug testing statute requires. I oftentimes, the first time I work with a, a business, I learned that they have a drug testing policy and when I ask to take a look at it, it's clear that that policy is not compliant with state law. And that becomes problematic because if you test employees under a drug testing policy that does not comply with state law, and you end up terminating an employee as a result of a positive test, that employee can immediately challenge their discharge as being a wrongful termination. And, and in many cases, they can be successful because you haven't complied with the state law requirements. So I think it's important that we spend a little bit of time talking about in just a high level, what Minnesota's drug testing statute provides. And so to start, uh, in Minnesota, employers can only drug test employees pursuant to a written policy and that written policy has to contain at minimum uh, certain provisions. And those provisions include uh, who is subject to the testing, whether it's employees or job applicants, the circumstances under which drug and alcohol testing may be requested or required, whether it's pre-employment, post-accident, reasonable suspicion, return to duty, follow-up testing, and what have you. The policy also has to outline that employees have the right to refuse to undergo the drug and alcohol testing, what the consequences are. Uh, you can also have, or, or you're required to have outlined in your policy, any disciplinary or adverse uh, action that may be taken as a result of a confirmatory test that verifies a positive test. Also, the policy has to outline that the employee as well as the applicant they have the right to explain a positive test on a confirmatory test and, and request and pay for another confirmatory retest. And then finally, any other appeal procedures that are available. This law is extremely comp, uh, comprehensive. And I would say that it is uh, one of the most restrictive, if not, the most restrictive drug testing statute in the country. Um, but with regard to the law, it also provides that before you do the testing, you have to give the employee and a job applicant a written notice of your drug testing policy. And you also have to post a notice of your drug testing policy in an appropriate location on the premises. And usually you'll post that uh, where you post other uh, uh, law, you know, legal notices. And then that notice also has to inform employees and job applicants that they can get a copy of that policy if they want to look at it during regular business hours. My experience is a lot of clients or a lot of business businesses forget to post a notice that it uh, in fact has a drug testing policy. And then of course, before you actually request a drug test, you need to obtain a signed form from the employer or the job applicant acknowledging that they've seen your drug testing policy. Now, 
there are other things that should be built into your drug testing policy, and that should include a section prohibiting, you know, drug use or activities on premises. So you should prohibit uh, the use, consumption, possession, or solicitation of a, an illegal controlled substance or a legal substance being used or possessed illegally. And of course, you know, subject to the changes uh, in the law that I'm going to talk about, you should also have a, a statement about the consequences of refusing to submit to testing as is required. So as an example on this slide, I know you could have an employee's refusal to submit to testing shall constitute a violation of the drug and alcohol testing policy and be considered a resignation of employment. And then as far as policies uh, or types of testing, as I indicated, uh, you should indicate in your drug testing policy what types of tests you're doing, whether you know, it's pre-employment where all applicants have to go through a drug test after a conditional offer of employment has been made, but before they commence employment. Um, and if you do that, your offer should explicitly condition that uh, the employee is submitting to the test and they have to take and pass the test uh, for the employment offer to be, to be a valid offer. If you outline and have post-accident testing, uh, certainly you should indicate when employees should be uh, subject to that post-accident test. And uh, so you can say a serious personal injury, a significant property damage, serious moving violation, serious safety violation where you leave that, uh, that discretion to yourself as far or to the company as to how you define serious. One thing I'll make note of is some of you may remember about six years ago, the Obama administration was really putting a restrictor plate on when employers could do post-accident testing uh, without an individualized inquiry. Essentially in 2017, OSHA was saying that if you do drug testing after uh, an on-the-job ac accident, you're discouraging employees from reporting their injuries and therefore you're in violation of the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Now, when Trump came into office, that policy went away and it has not come back under Biden, uh, but I'm concerned that it, it could still come back. But at this point, uh, it, it has not come back. Your drug testing policy can also have random testing. With regard to random testing, uh, random testing is limited to uh, under state law, limited to those who are performing a safety sensitive position. And for purposes of the law, a safety sensitive position is those positions which uh, an individual is performing functions where if they're impaired by drugs or alcohol, uh, that impairment would threaten the safety or health of any person. Uh, so if you do random, and I think I would say that the vast majority of my clients don't do random uh, unless uh, they're required to do so by federal law. But if you do uh, random, keep in mind it's limited to those who are in a safety sensitive position. And then of course, under state law, you can conduct reasonable suspicion uh, testing, and you can also perform uh, what is referred to as return to duty testing so that if somebody tests positive, uh, you can certainly build in that, hey, as part of your first positive test, uh, not only would we require you to go through rehabilitation, but also uh, before you return to work, you're gonna have to go through another uh, test essentially uh, to return to work. You'd have to take a drug and alcohol testing policy. And if you do that, you certainly could require an employee to sign a last chance agreement, acknowledging that any uh, behavior uh, going forward in violation of the policy would result in immediate discharge. And then of course, uh, as part of a return to duty, 
employers can also have what is referred to as follow-up testing, where somebody tests is positive, they go through rehabilitation, they take the return to duty uh, test, and oftentimes employers will do follow-up testing to ensure that the employee uh, is remaining clean and, and complying with their obligations. And under state law, you can do that. You can have these unannounced follow-up tests for up to two years following completion of the employee's rehabilitation program. Other provisions of state law is that the policy should outline the procedures you'll use to conduct a drug test. Uh, keeping in mind, although this isn't built into, doesn't have to be built into your state law, um, certainly you wanna make sure that the laboratory that you're using has a strict chain of custody procedure to ensure that the employee specimen is not tampered with, that you're actually using a state certified laboratory, that when the laboratory does the test, uh, if it's a positive, the initial positive test is confirmed uh, by uh, a, a confirmatory uh, second analysis. And then the policy should outline which drugs you'll actually be testing for. And of course, the most common uh, prior to the law coming into the existence with regard to recreational marijuana included marijuana, cocaine, ecstasy, ecstasy among others. And you, you can see on this slide, I've struck the word uh, marijuana because you're gonna have to decide what you're going to do with regard to marijuana. And I'll talk about what this new state law means in a moment, uh, but I still wanna cover some of your obligations under state law. And those also include that if somebody uh, undergoes a test, you have to provide them with the test results within three working days. And if it's a positive test, you have to tell the employer applicant that they have the right to submit any information they believe will serve to explain a positive result uh, or the re or reliability of uh, the fact that they weren't uh, using a drug or, or alcohol. They have the right to request a confirmatory retest of the original or request a copy of the test result. And if the employee or applicant tests positive for drugs, as a business, you may withdraw the applicant's conditional offer of employment, uh, or if it's an employee, you could discharge them or take adverse employment action against them, such as pay, placing them on an unpaid leave. Now, as I have highlighted here, subject to limitations on the first positive test, because as I've said, with regard to Minnesota law, you cannot terminate an employee on his or her first positive test, but you have to give that employee uh, a chance to participate in a rehabilitation program, and they have to have refused or failed to complete that program uh, before you can terminate them. And of course, question often asked, who's responsible for that? Uh, generally speaking, the employer will bear the cost unless such services are, are existing under your uh, current insurance program. Also uh, keep in mind that drug tests are confidential. Uh, certainly a positive test is, it should be treated as confidential and private because it shows the presence of a drug that can be legally prescribed under federal or state law. It also may disclose the existence of an employee's disability or medical information. And so we recommend to clients that drug and alcohol testing uh, results should be kept in a file separate from the employee's personnel file to ensure that confidentiality. In other words, keep it in the medical file versus the, the personnel file. So that's a very broad overview of Minnesota's drug and alcohol testing statute and some of the requirements. Now, with the existence of now recreational marijuana, this new law has essentially amended 
the existing drug and alcohol testing statutes in certain manners in which I'll talk about. So first, uh, the definition of drug is changed and specifically it removes marijuana and marijuana products from being considered a drug for testing purposes. And so the, the definition of drug and alcohol testing, generally speaking, no longer includes cannabis or, or cannabis testing. So what does that mean for employers? Well, generally speaking, um, the way this statute was drafted, the bill was drafted, is in Minnesota, we're going to have two tiers of employees. So, and this is the best way I can describe it. You're going to have individuals who are in a safety sensitive position. And then you're gonna have individuals that are working in a non-safety sensitive position. And for employees who are in a non-safety sensitive position, uh, you cannot require employees or applicants to undergo a pre-employment drug test. So as of August 1st, employers will be prohibited from requiring a job applicant to undergo cannabis testing for the sole purpose of determining whether they have the presence or absence of cannabis as a condition of employment. And so uh, you can't do the marijuana pre-employment testing unless it's required by state or federal law. Additionally, you also can't um, refuse to hire a job applicant because they take the test and they test positive unless it's required by state or federal law. So if you, if you mess up, you, you, you can't refuse to hire them even though they went through the test. And then finally, uh, what the law says is with regard to non-safety sensitive employees and applicants, you can't require them to undergo uh, cannabis testing on an arbitrary or capricious basis. With regard to uh, the non-safety sensitive employees, the law essentially says, the new law, it says that you can continue to conduct what's referred to as reasonable suspicion testing for marijuana, but you're gonna to have to have certain criteria that rise to the level of reasonable suspicion. And one is going to be that you have reasonable suspicion that the employee is under the influence of drugs and alcohol, or two, uh, that the employee has violated your written work rules, which prohibit the use, possession, sale, or transfer of cannabis while working for you, uh, or they've sustained a personal injury or caused an, uh, another individual to sustain a personal injury, or they've had a work-related accident, or they were operating or helping to operate machinery or equipment or vehicles that were involved in a work-related accident. And so for non-safety sensitive individuals, you could conduct uh, reasonable suspicion testing. Now, I think one caveat is that determining whether somebody is under the influence of drugs or alcohol, uh, if you're not doing it, certainly I would highly, highly recommend that as a business that you have your supervisors trained in reasonable suspicion, how to identify whether somebody is under the influence of drugs and alcohol, because I suspect that the plaintiff's bar will challenge somebody being sent to a test on the basis of, hey, you didn't really have reasonable suspicion that somebody was under the influence of drugs and alcohol. But if your supervisors go through the training and they are actually documenting uh, the reasonable suspicion that they observed, I think that helps prevent the claim from going very far.
now with regard to positions that are not subject to the new limitations on drug testing, um, that includes safety sensitive uh, persons. So those who are in a safety sensitive position, you can conduct uh, marijuana testing. And for purposes of the law, that means that they are considered, marijuana is considered a drug and individuals could be subject to drug and alcohol testing. So that includes people who are performing safety sensitive positions, uh, peace officers, firefighters, um, child care, uh, individuals who care for vulnerable adults, uh, also includes individuals that are required to have a commercial driver's license, uh, could include a position of employment funded by a federal grant. And of course, oftentimes employers receive grants from the federal government that requires uh, drug testing. And you could do the drug testing in that scenario as well. Other things to keep in mind is nothing under this law is going to prohibit you as an employer from establishing policies that permit uh, that or that prohibit employees from having marijuana or marijuana related uh, products on premises. So you can still have those policies, which many of you probably have as it relates to alcohol. You could have that with marijuana as well as the edibles. Um, and so certainly uh, employers can enact and enforce written policies that prohibit cannabis use, possession, impairment, sale, or transfer while they're working, while they're on company premises, or while they're using a company vehicle, machinery, or equipment. To make it abundantly clear, federal laws remain in existence uh, despite the state law. So uh, they don't impact any federal regulations that uh, specifically require drug and alcohol testing, and you can still uh, continue to do the drug and alcohol testing uh, in those scenarios. And you know, the one that I have clients ask me about most are the federal highway, you know, the DOT drug and alcohol testing rules, and those rules remain in intact. And if an employee is subject to the DOT rules and they violate uh, the DOT drug and alcohol testing rules, you can terminate and you can terminate without offering them rehabilitation in the first instance. Uh, certainly that's something as a business, you'll have to decide what you wanna do. Um, and I'm sure you've gone through that before or made that decision if you do have DOT covered drivers. Other things uh, to keep in mind is recreational marijuana is now considered a lawful product. And in Minnesota, we have what's referred to as a lawful products statute or a lawful consumable product statute. And essentially what that means is as a business, you cannot discharge or discipline employees for using a lawful consumable product. And under this new law, lawful consumable products include uh, not only uh, food and alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverages and tobacco, but it now includes uh, the marijuana and the hemp uh, derived edibles. Those are things that employees can do. They can tell you that they uh, eat the cannabis products at home and you can't take an adverse action against them. Now, there are some exceptions to the employer's restriction and uh, they're limited, but uh, as an example, uh, one exception would be is that if I'm running a, a, a clinic that is designed to rehabilitate employees as a result to rehabilitate uh, members of the general public as a result of their drug use, uh, certainly I think uh, you could say, look, you can't smoke uh, marijuana, much like um, the American Lung Association could tell someone working for them that, you know, we're not going to employ individuals who are, are smoking cigarettes just because, you know, that's contrary to the mission uh, of the organization. Now, 
the question you may have is, well, so what, what's a big deal if I terminate somebody as a result of uh, using the THC edible products or smoking marijuana? And it's a big deal uh, because with regard to the lawful consumable product statute, it essentially says that if you terminate somebody, those individuals can um, seek to be reinstated and seek to get their lost wages and, and benefits reinstated because of the violation. And they're also entitled to their attorney fees and costs. So I, I left uh, a lot of time here for uh, any questions that you may have. This is a, an overview of what the new drug and alcohol testing rules provide. And in essence, you can continue to do drug testing, uh, pre-employment drug testing for marijuana. Uh, you can't do it for non-safety sensitive employees. I think a lot of clients, uh, even before this new law came into place, they were dropping uh, marijuana from the pre-employment test for a variety of reasons, in large part, the feedback that I've been receiving over the last, I'd say probably the last five years is employers were dropping marijuana from the pre-employment uh, drug test simply because they couldn't find qualified candidates who could pass the test because uh, everybody was testing positive for the use of marijuana. I think there's a good reason for you to drop it now altogether just from the standpoint of you avoid the issue of whether or not somebody is employed in a safety sensitive position or not. Um, certainly somebody who's driving for you is in, uh, in a safety sensitive position. Uh, somebody who's working in a press room, I think the argument could be made that they're working in a safety sensitive uh, position. But of course, the law has not clearly defined all the positions that would be considered uh, safety sensitive. And so I think you wanna be very clear in describing how it is a safety sensitive position and how somebody who is impaired could uh, directly impact the safety or health uh, of others or themselves as a result of being impaired. Uh, this was uh, a lot of information. I covered this uh, in, a, in a short period of time, uh, but I will open it up for any questions that you may have at this, at this point. I haven't seen anyone enter any questions in the Q&A or the chat, but um, we can open up if anybody would like to answer a question um, right now, they, they can ask their question. Okay. And I would say that the most important thing for you to do as businesses now is you're gonna to have to take a look at your existing drug and alcohol testing policies, and you're gonna to have to make decisions with regard to what you're going to do with regard to the testing. And uh, you may just decide that you're not gonna test for marijuana at all, or you may just, just decide that if you do testing, it's just gonna be for reasonable suspicion, unless you're required to do it by federal law. Thea has raised her hand. Thea, go ahead and ask your question. I'm sorry. Thank you for uh, the presentation. Um, is your, uh, do you have a sample of a good um, um, policy on removing the uh, marijuana off of the policy? Yeah, so a, a great question. And I mean, we certainly draft uh, policies for clients. We don't, we don't give out samples just because there's a whole host of issues that you need to consider with regard to what you want to do and, and, uh, and what have you. And I always get a little concerned by that. Um, I do see that there was a question with regard to, are there tests that determine if marijuana was consumed recently? And that's a great question. And we still do not have 
uh, tests that show somebody is in fact impaired on the time at the time that you are doing the testing. I understand that there are a number of laboratories that are working on something that will show a real time uh, uh, impairment at the time of testing, but we don't have that technology yet. I had read, oh, probably six months ago that there was um, uh, a laboratory in Canada that was coming up with something, but I haven't seen anything yet. Uh, another question, uh, that I know is, is asked uh, often is, am I going to get a copy of the PowerPoint? And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, I'll make sure that Chris gets a copy of this PowerPoint so she can distribute it to the attendees. And of course, uh, this program is also being recorded. And then uh, with regard to what is the best practice of outlining positions that are considered uh, safety sensitive. You know, generally speaking, I think the policies will define, will say, define what a safety sensitive position is. Uh, certainly, I think you could go into the detail as to what you consider uh, to be safety sensitive as far as a position and be prepared to describe it, why, why you consider it a safety sensitive position. But a lot of policies are, are more generic in nature uh, with regard to, we just do tests for safety sensitive positions, but it's not a bad idea to include what positions are considered safety sensitive, because obviously I would say that somebody who is working as a customer service representative probably is not in a safety sensitive position. Somebody who's driving your trucks clearly is in a safety sensitive position. Any other questions? I don't see any other questions, Tom, and I don't see any hands raised. Um, so I think this means we could conclude the um, um, presentation, Tom, do you have any last uh, pieces of advice? If not, um, I will recommend um, signing off. So any anything else? Yeah, the last piece is uh, you have a deadline August 1st to get your policies up uh, up to speed. So that's uh, I think that's the most important thing is for you to consider how you're going to modify your drug and alcohol testing policies or how you plan to implement if you don't have one. And Tom's information is right there on that last slide. So if you do have any questions, he's available by email or, or phone. Um, we'll also make these slides available as well as the recording. Like I said, we'll probably try to get it out by the end of the day today, if not um, latest tomorrow. And um, we, we, we like to thank everyone for participating and um, being a part of this uh, webinar today. We thank Tom um, Revenu for his expertise. We appreciate it, um, your willingness to do this uh, webinar today for us. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.